Well, I hope you guys enjoyed your little break. Yeah. I did. Also, you guys are literally the room of the kindest people ever. So thanks for being so kind. Um, I get to sit up here for the next little bit with five of the most incredible people you will ever get to hear speak. This is Sherry and Michelle and Jordan and Tracy and Rosie, and I love them. And in 35 minutes, you're gonna love them too. So really, we could do an entire other conference just with them talking, but we don't have that much time. So I got to go to coffee with them and for hours sit and listen to their story. And then I had the job of convincing each of their whole life story into a minute. So here's what we're gonna do is I get the privilege to tell you just a real quick recap of each of their stories of what they were able to share with me. I get to share that with you. And then we're gonna ask them some questions and talk about it a little bit. So you guys ready? Yeah. Here we go. Grab the tissues, I ain't playing. All right, my girl Sherry. <laughs> Sherry spent 10 years of her life on the streets involved in prostitution. Four of those years, she was heavily drug addicted. And in 1991, when she was back in jail for selling, she found Jesus. She got married and had a daughter and they moved to Las Vegas. Sherry stayed in that relationship for 13 years, regardless of a lot of abuse. And one day felt the Lord released her from that marriage. One of Sherry's favorite things to do once she got to Las Vegas was to serve in the streets. She would take food and necessary items to those living outdoors. One Christmas day, while she was feeding her friends in the park, she found a two-year-old little girl who was very sick. She came back to the park a few days later to check on her and heard the Holy Spirit in the same voice he used in 1991 to say, take that little girl and help her get well. Sherry thought she would have this little girl for a short period of time, and the Lord had different plans. The biological mom wanted Sherry to adopt her daughter. Sherry was a single person who owned a cleaning business and had no idea how that would work. She had a group of friends that had been praying for this little girl, and one of them offered childcare completely for free without Sherry even asking. That was one of the many moments the Lord showed up. Thanks, friend. See, I said you guys are so kind. Savannah is 11 now. Look at her. That... You can talk into the microphone. Um, yeah, so the first picture on the left is um, what she looked like the night we brought her home. And that's my biological daughter with her. And then um, that, the one on the right is what she looks like, what she looks like now. So tell us about what that moment was like when you spontaneously and radically said yes to Savannah. What were you thinking when you said you would care for her? Yeah, well, I wasn't thinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, because at the time um, that I found her, like I was 54 years old, and um, um, I don't know, you know, she, I, you know, we were in the park, or we were at the park, and um, this is pretty emotional. Like, when you read that, I never, you know, it's like I'm thinking about all of it. And it's very surreal now that I have her for this long. But, um, I mean, I wasn't thinking when I sat her in my lap. Um, I just remember the words coming out of my mouth. Um, you know, can I take her home for a couple weeks? And and that's what happened. We, we brought her home and... and uh, and then I started thinking. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just been a, it's been a journey with her and um, everything kind of fell in place, you know, after I um, got her home and got her well and um, trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do with her because I'm single and I have a house cleaning business and, you know, have an outreach for the homeless and so... Um, so speaking of that outreach, 
How do you feel like you get to now see God use Savannah because of your obedience to care for her? Well, Savannah is very, um, she's been out with. Look at this she, baby girl on outreach. Yes. Savannah goes out with us all the time. She's very instrumental in me getting stuff together, you know, to go out there and, um, and feed our friends. And so she's very, um, she just, you know, and they know her. So a lot of them know her because when I found her um, on Owen and B Street, so in that area, I mean, there's a lot of them that know her. Um, and, you know, she just, she goes out and hangs out with them. You know, she just loves hanging out with them. Like sometimes I'll catch her off in a corner somewhere and she's just kicking it with the homeless people. You know, she's just having, a, having a conversation with them. You know, she's, you know, we're over here feeding them and then she's over here hanging out with them, you know, having, like I'll catch her in an alley or, you know, she's kind of fearless like that, you know, so she's, you know, she loves being out there with them. But it's because you planted that seed. Well, I think Well done. <laughs> Somebody planted it, yes. <laughs> All right, next up, my girl Michelle. Michelle met her husband, Preston, in Las Vegas. She had just come to know Jesus, and together they moved back to Colorado Springs. About five years into their marriage, they were told they could not get pregnant. Preston was in the military and deployed when 9-11 happened. The Lord really started teaching Michelle that he was who she needed to lean on for strength, not Preston. Much to their surprise, Michelle ended up getting pregnant. She delivered their first daughter, Alexis, at 19 weeks. Through that loss, Michelle had her first intimate experience with Jesus. They found out that their daughter, Alexis, had a birth defect, and when Michelle surprisingly got pregnant again, her second baby did not have that birth defect. So they were hopeful that this pregnancy would have a different outcome. Sadly, she delivered her second baby, Joshua, at 15 weeks. It was then that Michelle went into a dark depression. She ended up getting pregnant a third time before really having any healing from the first two and delivered Brianna at 24 weeks, just shy of her being able to sustain life. A few years later, Michelle came back to Las Vegas to visit her parents, and her and Preston ended up moving here, barely able to keep their marriage together. Preston asked for a divorce, and Michelle said, you get the papers and I'll sign, but Preston never did. They would be civil until an argument would come up. Michelle was incredibly depressed and didn't know it. In 2009, Michelle was walking and begging God for freedom, and God told her, not yet. She told the Lord that she would stay as long as he would stay too. Michelle had been leading a grief share group, and the Lord called her to do nothing for a year. Michelle, tell us what God birthed at the end of that year. Um... It started with brokenness. Um, when I was in that place and I had asked God that, I quickly learned that when I wanted him more than I wanted out, that's when things turned around. So I did absolutely nothing for a year and that was because he had a breaking down to do. Um, we're talking about planting a seed. That's good things happen in the dark. When you plant a seed, it's in the dark and you can't see it. There's a lot of breaking that has to happen before life comes through. So that year, there was an incredible amount of breaking. Um, he expanded my heart for women um, at Hope Church. I was there, led grief share, thought that was all I was gonna do. Um, and I sat with him one Saturday, just out of desperation, just to be with him. And out came a 17-page vision for what we now call the Life Center. Um, so we are literally in our 10th year this year with 60 plus volunteers of um, incredible humans that continuously run into the dark every day of people's life. I have a grief share team, a divorce care team, people who counsel one-on-one, -on -one, encourage one-on-one, -on -one, and an incredible bereavement team that helps people plan funerals from beginning to end. All the things that Preston and I did not get when we were going through the center of hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you, I remember hearing you say when we were talking 
that the church needed to have a safe place for people that were battling depression. I'm so thankful that you ran to Jesus and not from him. Michelle, you've told me more than once that the Lord didn't give you what he asked, what you asked for, but he actually gave you much better. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, he, God is so much more than we could ever imagine. Each moment he gave me something. When he birthed, when I gave birth to Alexis, he gave us his peace that surpasses all understanding. When we birthed um, Joshua, he gave me the power that held me in the darkness mm -hmm. that I didn't understand. And when we birthed Brianna, um, actually after our second child, he had brought me to the scripture where Jesus tells Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for your faith mm -hmm. that it not fail you. And that's all that God prays for. And then after uh, Brianna, that was where he had told me that faith will be made genuine to bring all glory to God out of First Peter. So he always gave me a piece of himself. And then out of all the hell that Preston and I walked through from going after each other, we were just, it wasn't about grief. Grief just uncaps who you really are. So we just became who we really were and took it out on each other. And now we're about to celebrate our 25th year Ooh. of marriage. <laughs> And out of everything, who, um, who this man is, is not because of anything that I did or begged for. It was when I stopped asking God for what I wanted mm. and started asking God for who he wanted that he began to transfer my husband all by himself. And he is the greatest man on this earth. He's just now leading Experiencing God. He just got done. He's sending me scripture. I never thought that imaginable. God will do it when we get out of the way. Amen. Amen. She also didn't tell you that she's Dr. Michelle Dickens, but whatever. All right, next up, we have my girl Jordan. Jordan and her husband, Chadley, have been married for almost 10 years. They have four kiddos, and if you can't tell, one on the way. They currently live in a 1,385-square-foot townhome and had been praying for a bigger home for their family to grow into. During the same time, they were connected to a ministry that was serving refugees in the center of town. God was doing beautiful things in the lives of these refugees, but the ministry was slowly fading as some of the laborers had left. They knew the Lord was calling them to pick up this apartment instead of their dream of a bigger house. This neighborhood, a place God sees, is full of refugee families. It felt like finding a hidden, a hidden inheritance. With that, they did not settle for a bowl of soup, their American dream of buying a big home. Instead, they wanted God's birthright, which was a better way. As a family, they started serving the nations right in our neighborhoods, in the apartment, they and a few friends offer ESL classes, citizenship classes, but Jordan mostly focuses on hospitality, a place where foreigners become friends and taste and hear and see the gospel. They welcome people in, offer them a cup of tea, and listen to their stories. Now every Saturday at 3 p.m., they gather to pray and to love on their neighbors from all over the world. Can you guys show that picture? <laughs> That's Jordan and her husband at the back, just living life with people in their culture, in the way that they feel loved. So Jordan, you said you have to, ignite it, you have to ignore the lie of the enemy <clears throat> that what you have to offer is not enough. Yeah, Carly, like you said, I'm a mom of four. I have a one-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old, this little one due in August. And we live in a 1,385 square foot townhome. Now, I didn't round that number because we are aware of every square inch of it. <laughs> I'm a homeschooling mom and a lot of life happens at home. So the Lord is constantly teaching me how to creatively use every inch of space. We've got baskets hanging in the kitchen for homeschooling supplies. Um, we're, we're always racking our brain where we can pull another inch. So about five, maybe six years ago, uh, my husband and I were praying and we really had it on our heart to begin opening up our home one night a week where we would share a meal and my husband would lead us through reading through the word and praying through the word um, despite my temptation to think my house is not right for this mm -hmm. or 
I don't have the energy or I don't sleep at night. <laughs> How am I going to prepare a home to welcome people into? Um, we went for it. And for about one year or so, it was six of us gathering faithfully. And after about a year, you know, we would average 30 some people on the weekly every Monday night coming into our home. And in that season, you know, the Lord talked to me a whole lot about hospitality. Or I talked to him a lot about hospitality. I think there's a reason, you know, Paul gives the exhortation to show hospitality without grumbling. He knew our temptation is to grumble in the midst of hospitality. Hospitality is my joy and I love it. But when you welcome 30 some people in your home every week, it, it becomes a discipline and it, it takes a little bit different of a form and coming up with creative ways to cook or coordinate food for 30 people. Um, anyway, so from there, um, at the end of our Monday night gatherings, a lot of time, if we have new friends, we'll flip over our, our dining room table and it's a wooden table. And on the bottom of this table, we have hundreds of signatures that we invite new friends who have broken bread with us to sign the bottom of our table. And by God's grace and just, in, I don't know, outrageous connections, we have multiple different nations on there. A couple months ago, we had um, the honor of having some Christians from North Korea and South Korea come in. And wow. this one Christian was imprisoned for years in, his, in North Korea. And he's sitting around our table and he's sharing his story and we're worshiping with him. At the end of it, he, we flip over our table and ask, asked if they would sign it. And I'm sitting in the corner and my eyes just start welling up with tears watching him sign it. And I'm having a moment with the Lord and I'm just thinking what I would have missed out on mm. had I said, my house is too small or I can't do that. Yeah. And, and it, at, the end of, at the end of every gathering, it's just a reminder it's worth it. It's Amen. worth it. You know, I don't have everything, but the Lord doesn't ask for everything. My ongoing motto in motherhood and missional living and ministry and marriage and homeschooling is just, Lord, here are my loaves and fishes. <laughs> Make something Amen. out of it. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Last question for you, Jordan. In our conversation before, you shared a question that the Holy Spirit put on your heart that kept coming back in the moments that the enemy wants to creep in. Yeah. Can you share that with us? Sure. Um, you know, about a year ago or so, we, my husband and I were praying and we both had it on our heart to put offers on a bigger home and explore that option in faith. And through that house buying search, our ongoing prayer was just, Lord, we don't want to settle for a bowl of soup. We want what you have for us. We don't, we don't want anything less. And, you know, there's times you pray that to believe that. And then there's times I think God gives you a grace and a faith to truly believe that. And that's where we're at. Um, we didn't end up finding a home. We put a couple offers. We all know the market is outrageous right now. And we just could not fathom paying or really indebting ourselves over half a million dollars for another bedroom and hopefully some backyard. We, we, we just couldn't settle in our spirit to use our resources like that. Um, about two months later or so, we came across this little apartment in the heart of Las Vegas. In this neighborhood, there are over 150 refugee families who have crazy stories. Um, and there was a little ministry saving there. They were down to about one super faithful, amazing laborer. And she was feeling called into the workplace. They were out of money. And... You know, we, we kind of got to know them, and it, it came to a place where we said, you know, if this ministry is going to fold, would you please let my husband and I know, and we will pick it up and carry it to the best of our ability as a family. Um, so that's exactly what happened. We signed over the lease. Uh, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> but we are figuring it out. We pack our loaves and fishes, and um, we continue to pray for laborers, even this last year. The Lord sent uh, two incredible ESL teachers, and we're wrapping up the school year for that. And God just continues to send aside the right people. Um, but I'd be lying, Carly, if I said it's always rainbows and butterflies, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Getting back to what um, you asked about this phrase, this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit keeps giving to me. Um, temptation wants to creep in, and I still have that thought in the back of my head my head, you know, a bigger house would solve all of my little petty woes. You know, you look at this house and this is a family from Afghanistan. They had four kids of their own, took in five kids 
from their brother or sister in Afghanistan. These kids got on a plane without their parents. Their youngest mm -hmm. is five. And they're in a 900 some square foot apartment with nine kids. You know, what am I grieving about? Mm -hmm. But that temptation still creeps in and I pour out my heart before the Lord. It's one of my favorite things to do. I highly recommend it if you don't. <laughs> There's a <laughs> psalm that says, pour out your heart before God. And it's all, it's all the unfiltered thoughts because he already knows them. <laughs> but it's where he meets me. Amen. And he says this little phrase and I keep hearing it. I, when, when, I, when I want to grumble, I say, Lord, why, what are these feelings? And, and I have these desires and I keep hearing this little phrase in my heart that says, Jordan, will you build my kingdom and I will build your house? Amen. Will you build my kingdom and I will build your house? And I have no idea if this house is on this side of eternity or not. <laughs> but I do know that Jesus told me he is going to prepare Amen. a place for me. And he's preparing a place for you. And he is the master carpenter. And he tells us to store our treasure in heaven where moth nor rust nor flood can destroy so that's our prayer in this season, that we would just be faithful to store a treasure in heaven and send our building materials up ahead because we know it's going to be good. Amen. Amen. All right. Next up, Miss Tracy. Tracy was... Yeah, you can cheer for Tracy. Okay. Tracy was born and raised in a very small town where everyone's friendly and you knew all of your neighbors. Her and her husband bought their first house in Las Vegas 13 years ago. Their first Christmas in that house, she started making hundreds of cookies, and her husband asked her what she was doing. She told him she was making cookies for all the neighbors, and he thought she was crazy. <laughs> in the last 13 years, she has loved her neighbors well and knows everyone on her street. Her son is three and a half and has sensory processing challenges, but knowing all the neighbors has been such a gift. They now serve the neighbors together, her son calls them each by name, and not only in their neighborhood, but their local grocery store as well as their church. Tracy knew that in a large church it would be challenging to get to know people, but she needed to make it a safe place for her son. So she started connecting with as many people as possible. She serves in the children's ministry, specifically in early childhood, and has built some really beautiful relationships. Tracy knows that God will use all kinds of people. You just have to pray, listen to God's voice, and follow. Tracy, tell me about the first time you remember listening to God's voice. That's her son, by the way. How cute is he? Yeah, <laughs> that's my little Finn. He's my last one. Um, well, first, I wish I would have come to the coffee because I got all teary hearing their stories. It was my first time hearing it, too. So it's, it's wonderful, and I'm in awe to be on stage with all of you because I don't consider what I do that great. <laughs> um, but Jesus does. It, that's all that matters. Um, <laughs> The first time, I think, you know, I have a master's in higher education. I worked at colleges and universities for 10 years across the country, and I really felt that was my calling, even though I had to switch my major in the middle and scare the pants off my mom that I would be unemployed. <laughs> um, but I was employed. And so the first time was I had this great degree, years of experience, 10 years in the field, and then I got pregnant. And they placed this little girl in my arms, and uh, the plan was I was going to take my three months and, and go back to work because I was going to be a vice president of student affairs. I was going to get my doctorate. And God said, no, you're not. Hmm. No, you're not. <laughs> so I came home and um, a few months into being home on maternity leave, I told my husband, I'm not going back to work. And he's like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And if we have to live on ramen noodles and um, Lucky Charms, it's okay. I've done it for a long time. I can do it longer. And so I felt God saying, you're going to make great disciples in your home. Amen. And you're going to connect people. Um, ever since I was a little girl, I uh, was always bothered by somebody left out. It didn't matter what they looked like, if they were weird, if they were the one people uh, poked fun at, it bothered my heart that somebody had to sit with that person, somebody had to be their friend. So when we moved on our street, you know, I wanted to have a community. And as I was baking those cookies, my husband said, well, we don't do that out here. And I said, I don't care what we do. This is what I do. And, uh, <laughs> and so we delivered an, and uh, to all these neighbors, and none of them had children. But they love my children. They know my kids. And we know Herb and Lou and Pete 
And, you know, Bob, who I called John for two years, I <laughs> we know him all in my son rides his, his bike up and knocks on their door, Mr. Pete, Mr. Pete. And uh, it's a beautiful community. I wanted to do the same in my, in my church because I walked into this huge building and they said, I can't have this. I got to have people that I can help. And even on our street, um, one of our, my closest friends was a police officer and his wife, and they moved to Mexico. And we all were like, well, he's moving on the street now. We were nervous. And then this family come on and they had huge parties and the construction guys. And so I went over to introduce myself and I brought some muffins and then she came to my house and we chatted because you know what, as Christians, we can talk to everybody. Not just the people who look like us, who, who know scripture, because knowing Jesus isn't about all that stuff. Right. Um, and she has tattoos all over, and she came to my house, and I have a, a wall that has crosses all over it. And she went, <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's that about? And she's like, there's no way Chris is coming in here. <laughs> I, said, I said, why? And she's like, well, you know, he doesn't do Jesus freaks. I'm like, that's all right. I, I, don't, I do all kinds of people. Well, he has tattoos all over, and they swear. I said, my brother is a mechanic. Like, I've hung out with guys with tattoos since I was little. I grew up on a Harley Davidson. Really? Yeah. So now she's come to our home, and um, she's going to actually come to church next week. She asked me about it. And then she started to tell me her story of how hurt she was by Christians, and it hurt my heart. Because I, I hate hearing people hurt by religion. Because then we're getting it wrong if they're hurt. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Last up, my girl Rosie. <laughs> Rosie has her private fan club. She brought them. <laughs> All right. Rosie grew up in foster care after her mother was declared unfit. She remembers coming home from school one day when she was five and walking up the street to see social workers who would eventually take her and all of her siblings into care, where they would be split into multiple homes. Thankfully, she would see her siblings most weekends during visitation. Four years went by with them all in foster care, and her mom had done everything she needed to to get them home. Just a few days before they were set to return, Rosie was in her foster home watching TV and saw a house on fire that looked just like her mom's home. Someone had thrown a bomb in the window, which killed seven people, including her mom and grandma. Amongst all the other devastation, this meant that they could not go home and ended up spending another year in foster care. Six of the siblings ended up moving in with a paternal grandma. Twenty-three people lived in a three-bedroom apartment. She suffered much abuse at the hands of multiple people in that home. Rosie was angry at everyone. But at that apartment, every weekend, there would be a giant yellow bus that would come and take a bunch of kids to church. Rosie specifically remembers Chris, a white boy who did not fit in, but moved to the inner city to be with the kids there. Chris was one of the first men that Rosie ever saw be loving. She dove into the program that Chris ran, memorizing so many Bible verses, but using those same Bible verses to be a Pharisee. Everyone knew that Rosie would have a Bible verse comeback for whatever they said or did. <laughs> At the age of 16, Rosie really met Jesus. Her senior year of high school, she moved in with one of her youth leaders. She then learned that family was not blood, but the people who loved her during hard moments. She met her husband, Ricky, that summer. A few years later, they were married. Rosie's biological father has since apologized, but she will never forget the time she was driving in the car with her grandmother and her uncle, who was one of her abusers, and he started singing a worship song that was playing on the radio. She was so angry. He had taken so much from her, and now he was also trying to take the one thing she had that was her own, her faith. In that moment, Rosie clearly heard the Lord say, the gospel is not just for the molested, but also for the molester. Woo. Sis, that's a heavy statement. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? For sure. It is a heavy statement. Um, and it's honestly one that I've wrestled with the Father with. But um, Jesus put on flesh. He came and lived the, the, life, the life that I couldn't live. 
-hmm. He died the death that I should have died, all so that we could be in right relationship with him. And so the reality of it is, um, when he was flogged and beaten, like that was for my sin, like not just Calvin's, but mine as well, which equally meant that my sin too was a stench before this pure and holy God. And that when he died um, and was seated at the right hand of the throne of God, he extended to Calvin the same invitation that he extended to me, which was to be in a right relationship with him. And that is still a hard truth and still something that I wrestle, or used to wrestle with greatly. Um, and I would like angrily ask God, like, why, why would you extend salvation to someone who would commit such a heinous crime? Um, but then the question had to become, what do you consider a heinous crime? Um, and do you and God have the same definition hmm. of a heinous crime? Um, and so, and if we didn't, it had to be that my definition was wrong um, because that one act, if he is were wrong, would disqualify him from being God. That would mean he wasn't a spotless lamb. Um, and I know that that's not true. So the reality of it had to be that I was the one who was wrong um, and that I couldn't only care about the sins that I consider unforgivable. Um, because what about like the little white lies or what about gluttony or like what about God's standard of all of this? And so, um, which meant that Jesus' blood on the cross had to reach to Calvin as well. It had to extend that far. Um, and in moments where I'm like, but wait a minute, like let's, <laughs> hey, let's talk. Let's talk about this standard. Um, I think about what God said to Job. and He asked him, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Mm -hmm. And the reality is I wasn't there when he told the waters where to stop. And sure, I could try to come up with criteria for who was deserving of grace and who isn't. But in doing so, I would disqualify myself as well. And so it's a heavy statement, um, but it's still true. Amen. So can you tell us a little bit about how the Lord is currently using what you experienced growing up for his kingdom? Yes. Um, and, but before I start, I think one of my favorite things about the Father is that he is able to use even our brokenness for his glory. Um, that five-year-old girl had no way of knowing that as I sat in foster care, um, torn away from my family, that t nearly 20-something odd years later, the Lord would allow me to work with children in care. And that I would be able to be a part of the, the conversations as we're talking, court orders and disruptions and reunification and all of this stuff. Um, and that I wouldn't look at those kids with, I can only imagine statements, because the reality is I could imagine. Amen. And I knew firsthand what that felt like. Um, or I currently work with girls who've been trafficked. And so when I'm walking with them, um, talking about the trauma and stuff that they have, walk through is not with I can only imagine statements because I can imagine and I know firsthand what it looks like to for your innocence to be stripped from you and to cry out for help to no avail um and so I think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 he says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who comforts us in our affliction so that we may comfort those in their affliction with the same comfort that we ourselves have received from God um, and so when I'm sitting or when I would sit with those kids in care or when I'm sitting with the girls um, who are walking through it, I am reminded that the Lord was kind enough to bring my story full circle mm -hmm. um, in ways that doesn't really make sense. Um, he doesn't he doesn't waste our pain. He uses everything, um, even our pain, even our brokenness. He literally wastes nothing. And so it is because of that that I'm able to say present day, that five-year-old girl now has a master's degree in counseling and is pursuing a doctorate um, that, I am, that I'm currently authoring my first children's book about a young girl in foster care. And so I think about these things, and I'm just reminded that um, we serve a God who is incredibly purposeful. Amen. And who um, he knew, he knew back then that those things would be used for good, but I didn't. And so when my husband told me 10 years ago, hey, I feel called to the multi-ethnic church um, to be a bridge, if you will. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Because when he says this, I immediately think of Chris and Heidi and Tammy and Blair and Chrissy and all of these people um, 
but I would be lying if I didn't say that it's not, it's not easy. And by definition, being a bridge is hard because bridges get walked on. Mm -hmm. And so um, ministry is hard and ministry is complex, but I'm simultaneously reminded that when I was 10 years old and that yellow school bus came through my neighborhood, even at that moment, the Lord began cultivating in me the ministry that he would call my family to. So here we are 10 years and three states later, um, helping to bridge the multi-ethnic church. Amen. Amen. Okay, it's been 35 minutes. Do you love all of them? Like so much? Our goal was that by the time each of them shared their stories that you would be able to see yourself in one of them. And so I hope that you've heard what they all had to say is that the Lord will use whatever you've been through, that there's absolutely nothing that is wasted in the kingdom.